Bottom material, I'd like to, to put up here. Thank you all for coming. I hope you'll get some good information out of this. Um, and if there's a question you have and it seems really relevant right at the moment of the slide and the topic, just raise your hand just to catch my attention. We can take the questions. We don't have to hold all the questions at the end. But certainly detailed questions about how to like do this particular thing on my particular phone and computer. We want to defer that kind of stuff to the end. Uh, so <laughs> I'm the dad of a 6th grade student here at Green Meadow. I have a 10th grader at the public high school, Cascade Hills. Um, I'm a Green Meadow Parent Council. I'm a software developer, background in computer programming, so I, I would be considered relatively high tech. Um, and yet I'll certainly say a lot of the things happening uh, online are much faster than I can keep up with, and it's a big part of my business. So if you feel a little bit lost sometimes, don't, don't feel too bad about that. Um, this is an overview of what I'll talk about tonight. Uh, some basic risks to online activity, which really are relevant to anyone going online, not just the kids. Um, the importance of the age of your children, and figuring out what the risks are and what's going on, what they're doing. Uh, how kids go online, what you can do to limit their time. Uh, inappropriate content, and how to restrict it. That's a very important topic. Um, and then just some general practices and really staying safe and making sure the kids are staying safe. So, what kind of risks are there? Um, let, let everyone stay calm. Uh, I've thrown on a bunch of things on here, you know, just like the real world, just because there is a risk of something happening doesn't mean it's going to happen, it doesn't mean it's likely to happen, but better to throw them out there and, and talk about them because they are real. Um, Malware and viruses that take advantage of your younger computer users, easy to trick. Adults get tricked, kids are even easier to trick. You end up with viruses, they slow down your computer, they can make your computer inoperable. In extreme cases, uh, viruses and malware can you know, do things like start to look at your passwords and try to hack into uh, email accounts and things like that. Um, the loss of privacy and private information becoming public. So a lot of the, your online activity is constantly monitored, monitored. If you use a Gmail account, for example, um, it's a free account. Great, terrific, free. I love it. I use it myself. The content of every Gmail message you ever send or your child sends is tracked, read by Google, processed into their databases, stored, kept permanently. And the simplest test of this is, if you have a Gmail account, send an email to your friend, say, say in the email, uh, you know, I'm really thinking of a vacation to Tahiti. And starting about 10 minutes after you send that email, and probably for the next month, you will be bombarded by uh, ads on the side of your account about uh, options for, for vacationing in Tahiti. It'll be travel agencies, it'll be, you know, airline fare, anything you can imagine. And this is basically, you know, what happens as soon as you, you go online. Um, a risk uh, which a lot of people miss, there's a permanent record of, of what's going on. Um, the, the people collecting, the companies collecting this information, they can discard it, but they certainly don't have to. And a lot of it stays for years and years and years. And so mistakes, which are the kind of things that kids can do, uh, can really come back to haunt them in later years. <clears throat> Exposure to age inappropriate materials. I'm going to talk, I'll actually sh give a quick demo of how that happens very much by accident sometimes, um, but there's a lot of age inappropriate content out there on the internet. Um, excessive usage and patterns of addiction. Uh, you know, everyone is different, but some kids really get in trouble with just really addictive patterns of needing to get online, whether it's a social issue, whether it's game playing. You kids really get wrapped up into it. Uh, stress is a big problem. Social media, cyberbullying. That's um, probably people have read about that in the news. Um, one of the things about cyberbullying that's particularly nasty is that, unlike a bully who's on the playground and actually there um, and has to actually confront you with the things they they say, there's kind of a in-person social uh, force field in play sometimes. Cyberbullying does not have that. People will say some of the most unbelievable things to each other online um, that they would probably never even say in person. Um, and so this cyberbullying can really become a problem. And lurkers and predators, um, they're out there. Lurkers are, are 
people who are kind of watching everything that's happening but without actually engaging, um, which is kind of creepy on its own. Uh, they may be less of a risk than predators who are actually looking to find innocent uh, kids on the internet. Um, and well, of course, one of the things here that's different about in the real world is that you can pretend easily, pretend to be absolutely anyone and anything online. It is, there is nothing stopping me from going online right now. And I may, if I have time, I'll demo this. I can go online in, in about three minutes. I can create a email account and a Facebook profile for a 14 year old girl. And that is nothing is going to stop me. Facebook's not gonna try to confirm who I am or anything like that. And if I can do it in three minutes, anybody can do it. So age is really the big issue in terms of thinking about what's appropriate or not. I've kind of broken things down into three rough groups here, very young children, tweens, and teenagers and young adults. And really dealing with the different challenges, it's, it's really very different for each group. So I won't spend too much time talking about very young children. H how many people here have kids in this age? Can I maybe see a show of hands? Okay. Um, well, they, really the focus here is just limit their access, right? There's, they really don't, there's nothing they need to get online. There's no reason. This goes beyond anything that has to do with the school's policy and things like that. Just in general, there's nothing they really need that's online, uh, whereas it's a very different situation for older kids. Um, and fortunately, at this age, there's not a lot of interest. They're certainly not interested in social media. Some of them might be interested in a few of the simple online games that are basically shoot this and shoot that and uh, relatively harmless. So this is an easy group to, to deal with, keep them offline. Teenagers and young adults, um, they present a lot of problems. Um, my suggestion here is to really focus on, on clearly communicating the risks to them. And the reason my, I suggest that as a focus is that um, you know, it's, hard to dif it's hard to limit their time. They have legitimate reasons to be online, and so limiting it is difficult in that sense. And restricting content's tough because, well, you know, if they're doing their homework and they need to be online to research something, you probably don't want to be over their shoulder all the time um, watching what they're doing. That can lead to a lot of conflict. The teen, this age group certainly really guards its privacy. Um, and so this is a little tough to manage. And we'll, we'll talk in, in a little bit about some of the automated ways you can do that. Um, they can be very naive about the impact of their online activities. Uh, these kinds of young adults really think they understand everything and all the implications of, of what they're doing online. They probably tend not to worry about it either, which is natural for their age. This last item about being over 18, um, that's when some things go from inappropriate to possibly illegal. And so as an example, and this is something that really happened um, in a town near me, if a 16-year-old girl texts um, a topless photo of herself to her 17-year-old boyfriend, and the boyfriend then forward that, forwards that out to 10 of his friends, and then 10 friends to 10 of their friends. Um, so that's highly inappropriate, it's a little bit scandalous. If it's an 18-year-old boy, okay, and his 17-year-old girlfriend, you've now gone from scandalous to illegal, because now there are issues of child pornography that come into play, and depending on who becomes, now there's something like this can happen and then it boils over and it's, it's done. But depending on who becomes aware of it and what they want to do, someone can push an issue like that and it can become very, very difficult. Um, and I've seen that happen in towns uh, near where I live. I've heard about that ex exact scenario. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, this is the troubling, uh, for me, this is, this is the tough age group, the kids that are in between. Um, fortunately, there's a lot you can do with them. Uh, they, they know very little bit, very little about what the online risks are because it's very new to them. Um, I, I guess everyone has heard from their kids in this age group, everybody has a fill in the blank, cell phone, computer account, Facebook, it's all lies. <laughs> no, it's not true. Everybody doesn't have it. Um, that's what they say. That's the standard, you know, that's the standard mechanism for leverage with their parents. Um, I find this age group uh, 
I don't know, very powerful and effective naggers um, in terms of, the, you know, they really want this, they want to feel older and grown up, and they really uh, can really push a parent to, to open up the doors, to become more flexible, um, and it's difficult. Uh, they can definitely catch you off guard with their tech skills. Uh, you might not, because they're coming of age and getting older, you don't usually think of them as being tech savvy, but if they're getting online, it could be at a friend's house or in other contexts, not even at home, they can get very good, very fast with technology. They're great natural learners. They're very curious at this age. Um, so they can really catch you off guard and surprise you with what they can do. Um, I, my own older son, who's now 16, for at least three to four months, maybe a little bit, little bit longer, had his own email accounts. When I told him he couldn't have email and he didn't have email, this is back when maybe he was 12 or 13, he just went on and he created everything on his own. He, you know, he did it with aliases, um, very savvy, caught me by surprise, and I'm kind of, that's, you know, tech is my background, so I was caught by surprise. Anybody could be caught by surprise by that. Um, they're just getting old enough to be left alone and unmonitored, right? They're coming into this age where you feel a little relaxed, you know, maybe it's a little time off as a parent. You're used to being on top of them all the time. Here's the chance to let that go, let them have some private time. Private unmonitored time means possibly private unmonitored online time. And so that becomes an issue. And we, as parents, we're very busy. We all want to break. Um, but it's, that's one of the reasons this is really a tough age. And <laughs> this last item, they're curious. Their curiosity is healthy. We want to promote their curiosity online. It can simply lead them astray really quickly. OK, I will show you how quickly in the first demo. Um, I'm going to show you stuff that, ha that I know happened either to with my older son when he was younger, when he was 12 or 13, um, or s other kids that I've known. So I'm just going to go on to Google. And forgive me for putting my back to you. So here's the, the verbatim typed in by my silly son when he was about, I don't know, maybe he was 12, maybe he was 13. This is typical boy stuff, big butts. Sounds, sounds innocent, seems innocent. You get back this list, you know, is it innocent? Well, let's see. Let's make it so we can see the whole screen. Well, we've got some links here that are to silly stuff. We've got some links here that are to some hardcore pornography, which is that right side of the screen. Those are the Google ads, right? The Google search is the main part in the center. The side is the ads. That's Google saying, wow, if you've typed big butts, they don't know your age, right? You're just someone who's come along and done a search. This is what they think you're interested in, and this is targeting to you, you know, what are the links from their sponsors. And with one click, as I go from the web response to the image list, we get this. A, everything from the ridiculous, and if I keep scrolling down, we'll get eventually to the hardcore. Okay? So this is, I mean, this is typical kid stuff for this age group. This is not what we really want them to be seeing. Um, I will show you another kind of thing. My son was reading, and please don't tell my son if anyone here knows him that I've mentioned him so much tonight. I'm using him as a foil, but it's because, it, because it's real. I think it's, you know, I, I want everyone to realize that I'm not making any of this up. He had been reading, um, he had been reading the war novel uh, by uh, Eric Remark. Uh, can someone help me with the title? Oh, oh yeah, All Quiet on the Western Front. Wonderful book. In fact, I recommended the book to him. He was reading it. And he looked up on Google, War Wounds. So a lot of the book has, goes into some graphic topics, or well, slightly graphic topics about war wounds. And again, you know, the text doesn't really give it, do it justice, but if you just, and people do this all the time, if you just click on that images tab, it changes the search now from the text links to, to imagery of war wounds. And we have here decapitated heads, blown off hands, I mean, some of this is really gruesome. And depending on the age of, of a child who 
out of their legitimate curiosity, types in something like this, they are getting back way more than, uh, than they thought they were going to be getting back. And they don't have the judgment to understand what's going on here because they're so young. So healthy curiosity can really get you into trouble uh, when you're young and you've got access to Google. So some of the things we can do to help them stay safe. Um, you know, there's no perfect solutions. Uh, this is, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to sell myself as an expert. I'm a parent. I've gone through this. Um, I have the same concerns, I think, as most of the people here do and most of our peer parents in the school. Um, setting expectations and rules, limiting the time online. This is really important. Um, restricting access to certain material. That's what I do that um, with my, uh, much more, of course, with my younger child, who's the sixth grader. I am much more attentive to the content of what he's looking at than I am with my older son. And communicating with the kids regularly, just to, I'm trying to always find out what they're interested in, what, they're, what they kind of know about what's going on online, and then just trying to go back and have a back and forth with them that's, that's somewhat healthy. So if you're interested in the amount of time online, um, I just want to talk quickly about how the kids get online and what you can do to manage that. Um, this can be a little surprising. We all know smartphones, computers, and tablets. If you have a game console like an Xbox or a PlayStation, you have complete unrestricted access to the internet. Built into your Xbox and built into your PlayStation is a web browser just like Chrome or Internet Explorer and the entire internet is available, and as long as there's Wi-Fi in the house, the Xbox can be connected to it. It's as good as if they were sitting in front of a computer um, on their Mac or whatever with the browser open, so total access. Uh, same thing with handheld devices, PlayStation Portable, PSP, full browser right there in their handheld device. Do you have a question? For the Xbox and that kind of access, do you have to have Wi-Fi? Yes. Absolutely. For the game consoles, they... That's right. If the, yes. And, and, and of course, then if you turn Wi-Fi off, it, uh, then it, you don't have access to your own Wi-Fi. So that's a great thing to do. I do the same thing. So, and um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we'll talk about today. Being, if you know enough to get into your router, you can tell it don't allow any data connections after certain hours or at certain times, but that's that's not necessarily easy to do. Um, a few less obvious ways of going online, ebook readers, right? The, any, if your Nook or your Kindle's got color, it's for sure unrestricted access to the internet, which has a built-in browser. You go online, most web pages will work, video will work. The, the black and white e-ink ones, that's not necessarily the case. So these are the color uh, e-readers. New televisions, if you've bought a television in the past, say, I'd say a year and a half or two years, like an LED flat screen TV, good chance it has a built-in web browser in the TV and built-in Wi-Fi, which means that you, you, who would think, but you can load up a browser and just surf the internet right from the TV itself with the remote control. I got really caught by surprise by this um, when I found out my television could do that. It was not a feature I was looking for. Um, and the near future, Google Glasses, watches are now available. Uh, they're just becoming available, which means it's Dick Tracy. You know, it's take a look at the watch. It's got a news feed and a browser on it. And if it's, some of it's out there now, and some of it's coming very soon. Um, you know, my recommendation here, house rules. Especially effective, I think, with tweens. Just set an expectation. You know, if you can be online, this is the time you can, or an amount of time that's a limit, and, and try to enforce it as strictly as possible. Uh, passcode your phone and your computer. So, so when they can't get online, the second place they're going to look is your device. If you're in the habit of lending your phone to your kids, um, or letting them get onto your laptop, uh, maybe you think it's just to do a quick few minutes here about some homework, or, you know, type something up, but... Uh, you know, if your laptop has unlimited access to the internet and your child uses it for a little while, they have the same access. Same thing with the phone, any kind of smartphone. So 
I use a passcode. If they're easy to set up, I have an Apple iPhone. It takes you know, 30 seconds to set up a passcode. I'm sure it's similar on, on just about every phone. Maybe a few, maybe it takes a minute on a Mac um, or a Windows laptop, but well worth it, just so that you're the only person with access. And pick a password that's not too easy. The kids are great at guessing passwords. If it's obvious to you, it might be obvious to them. So I, many kids I know have figured out their parents' passwords. Um, if you're interested, I mean, I'm doing a quick demo here um, about usage controls for, for telephones, right? This is um, really useful. Uh, it doesn't matter Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, they all support this. I'll log in now to my own phone uh, plan with Verizon, and I'll show you the actual restrictions I have set up. And it'll just take a minute. And this is really worth doing. Usually it's free. It depends on the plan. It, it, could, be, uh, it could cost up to $5 a month, um, depending on the particular plan that you have. But it gives you a lot of flexibility in what you can control about, um, well, that's not the browser I want. It, you get a lot of flexibility. You can put limits on the amount of text messaging that can happen, the amount of data that can be downloaded to a particular phone. You can set restrictions on the time that it can be used. So you can say, you know, it can only be used uh, in the evenings up until this time, and then the phone just stops working. Um, and you can always have some kind of list that's um, a safe list. So for example, you wouldn't want your child's phone maybe to completely stop at 8 p.m., right? You want to be able to call you, and almost always these plans allow you to set up a list of people that no matter what the restrictions are, no matter what time it is, they can always reach a certain list, and that list typically would get things like that. Please don't uh, look at my password and reuse it. I don't want anybody hacking into my Verizon account. Again, you'll see the restriction that I have for my son, Zachary. He's about 16 and a half. He has fought tooth and nail to have no restriction on his phone. I have had a hard time uh, holding the line, I'll admit. Um, it has been tough. He's, he's old enough now where he can actually sort of have a rational argu argument with me about why I shouldn't set up these usage restrictions. It's, he's getting close to convincing me. For now, I still have it. Um, for me, it's a sanity check uh, with him. So it's like a week. The restriction is basically on the weeknights, uh, the phone just stops working at about 1130. And it cannot work again until 630 the next day. Now, he thinks that's a horribly strict restriction. I think it's the loosest restriction you could possibly have for a 16-year-old. And that's the kind of conflict we face with this age group. It's, it's you know, it's tough. Um, but in terms of setting it up, just so you can see, um, so you can see, that, uh, if you have multiple phones, you pick the phone that you want. It's not a restriction on every phone. Um, you can set here, um, here's, uh, here, if you go to usage limits, you can see it's his phone. I set here a data limit, so he has only a certain amount of data he can use each month. Um, I can go in here and set restrictions on how many minutes of talk time, uh, how much text messaging he can do. Um, and if you go here to time restrictions, it's pretty straightforward. You can see this is his restriction right here. It's these days and these times are when he can't use the phone. And if you just go, if I wanted to add a new one, you know, I mean, is it easy to do? I mean, it's, it takes a few minutes to do this, but uh, it's certainly not difficult. You go in here and set up the times the way you want them. And you can add them, change them, you know, things like that. It, it takes a few minutes. It's certainly, I find that it's effective and it's worth learning how to do this. It's very similar on any plan that you might have. I won't change his restrictions or I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll hear it from him. Um, so the kinds of age inappropriate content, maybe social networking, depending on the age and how they use it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a couple of these things. Um, so forget about the, the social network site helping you. 
enforce any kind of restrictions. Not going to happen. No matter what you read in the news, forget it. Their businesses, their incentive is to keep everything open. They don't want you to have too much privacy turned on because the way they make their money is to look at the information that you have and repurpose it and sell it and republish it. They don't want privacy. The more privacy you have, the less money they make from you as a user. And since you don't pay for the site, that's the business model. Um, they absolutely don't care about your privacy. They do not care about your exposure. Um, half the time they don't even know what your real age is because a lot of kids set these accounts up and lie about their ages. Um, the big issue here is a Facebook, which represents 90% of the social network universe. Um, you, 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 some of you may have kids who you've heard are using Twitter, Instagram. Uh, Instagram is kind of like Twitter, but it's with the photo. So the stat you send out a status update with the photo and all the people that follow you can, can see that. Um, Snapchat is a perfect example of how kids go wrong and can be so easily fooled. Snapchat started as, a, as um, selling itself as a safe method um, to be able to text a picture to someone which would appear on their phone and automatically delete itself within five seconds. That was the whole thing with Snapchat. So kids could now, you know, they heard from their parents, it's not safe, you send this text message it's, or this picture, it's inappropriate, it's on your phone. So Snapchat came in and said, well, it's a self-destruct, right? Well, not right, because in the five seconds that you can look at that picture, you can actually save the picture. So kids think they're using Snapchat safely and that everything is self-destructing, but it's not because it's, it doesn't really work that way. The person who receives it can save it, and then they can take it and they can forward it in other ways. And the big thing that Snapchat says is, well, if somebody saves the picture that you sent them, you'll get a message telling you that they did that. Well, that's terrific if you send a naked picture of yourself to somebody and you find out, oh, they saved the picture, uh, by the way, uh, and they're about to send it to 10 other people. Thanks a lot, Snapchat. But that's, uh, that's a typical way, you know, that a naive younger person, you know, they don't think it through all the way. This is just a mostly comprehensive list of the kinds of uh, inappropriate content that's out there in one form or another. Um, and it's all out there, right? I mean, it's just all easily accessible. Um, Self-harm promotion may be something that's a little bit less familiar to people, but uh, young girls in the age group, you know, 13, even uh, up to 15, 16, dealing with depression issues and psychological stresses um, can get involved with self-harm. And they're actually, you would think mostly you'd find resources of people helping your girls avoid that, but you can also find websites that promote it. Whereas where girls who might be doing it might be promoting it to other girls as, as something to do, maybe as a way to get attention, maybe as for another reason, but it's certainly out there. And the kind of sources, general websites, all the video streaming sites are filled with inappropriate content. I can make any kind of inappropriate video I want and post it in YouTube in just a matter of minutes. And again, even the sites that have policies, so YouTube has a policy, Facebook has policies about what's allowed or not allowed on the site. But how, does it really, really enforce that? Facebook has a billion users. They can't check every video that gets uploaded. And the way those policies usually work is that the only time anything gets taken down is because someone lodges a complaint. If nobody lodges a complaint, then the inappropriate content that totally violates even Facebook's loose policies, it just stays there. Kids are looking at it, nothing's happening. Until some parent sees it, or some other interested party sees it and lodges a complaint, it won't usually even be checked. It's just too many users and too many videos out there for these sites to, to manage all that. Um, I won't get into video games, but <laughs> there's a short list of incredibly inappropriate video games. And where you can get fooled here with an older kid is a game like Grand Theft Auto, and your older child says, well, it's just a racing game. We steal cars in the game when we drive around and crash the cars and hit the pedestrians. And that sounds OK. Well, how bad is that? But you can also pull your car up into a bar and have a lap dance. You can uh, see unbelievably sexually explicit material in the video game. Okay, either in cutscenes of videos or in the gameplay itself. So a lot of, and you know, do you expect that from a game that sells itself as, as being about stealing cars and racing cars? No, you wouldn't.